everyone. My name is Kelly, uh, and I'm from the Ohio State. And I thought this was a nice compliment to Jason and Yen's work, because what we're going to talk about is actually when mankind starts interacting with the deep biosphere and how life changes, or we change the environment, and then life responds. And so the model system that I'm using is hydraulic fracturing, so it's natural gas extraction. And we'll talk a little bit about it. This is actually our, one of our field sites. This is in West Virginia, which happens to be in my backyard in Ohio. It's about three hours away. Oops, this way. OK. So these guys kicked off a great intro for me. I don't have to talk much about this. So it turns out when you work, <laughs> the terrestrial ecosystem is where you work if you're like me, and the idea of being on a ferry boat for 25 minutes makes you nauseous. So I stay firmly planted on the continents. Um, and actually, Jens, to, we're going to talk a little bit about life in an aquifer. I'll show you some pictures about small life. And so those would be the soft rock analogy. But where we're going today when we're talking about actually hydraulic fracturing and gas extraction is deep into the sedimentary rock, so the hard rock analogy. And so what we have to keep in mind as we move deep into the terrestrial biosphere is that in the surface and even in our aquifer systems, our freshwater systems, there's a lot of porosity. And so organisms have plenty of space to colonize. There's a lot of nutrient exchange. And there's a lot more energy available. As we delve deep into this kind of sedimentary rock layer, we're going to have increases of pressure and temperature. And really, we're going to talk a lot about porosity when we talk about deep shales. OK, so I don't have to talk about this too much, but this is a reality, especially in the United States. And so here I am in Ohio, and you can see the Marcellus. It contributes a large amount of um, potential hydrocarbon energy stored in the United States. And in fact, it's a very young industry. And so I actually started at Ohio in 2013. And you can see here, this is 2010. And the amount, the contribution that shale energy in this region alone has had to the eastern seaboard. So it's a huge contribution in natural gas. I wanted to bring this up because this is something that's going to affect all of us in our lifetime. And it's how we manage this ecosystem. And there's many controversial issues associated with the politics of this. Um, and so this is, you know, here we are in Germany, and here we are in the States. And here's the distribution of these energy reserves across the United States and the world. OK, so let's talk about shale as a habitat. And so when we started in this system, um, we work with a lot of geologists. And they would always tell us, they'd call us one, the bug girls, because there was a team of myself and two grad students. And they'd say, you guys, there's no life down there. Why are you even looking at these rocks? Um, and their, their arguments were it was paleopasteurized. And so, as Jens introduced to us, it's this idea that in diagenesis that, that the rocks were heated to a level that couldn't support life. But implicit in that assumption is that there is no immigration into the system. And so we kind of thought that these were really isolated systems and there was no input from the outside. It turns out that in shales we have very small pore sizes. And so we're talking about you know, these kind of ranges, these basically habitats for microbial life that are maybe around five micrometers. But the key here is the pore throats. The opening to those pore spaces are really, really narrow. And so what we think about microbial life may preclude life from existing in those pores. Today, we're going to be talking about depths of 2,500. We're going to talk about elevated pressures. We're going to talk about temperatures that are like the hottest day in Death Valley, and salinities that are about four times that of the ocean. So these are all things that if you're going to exist in this habitat, you're going to need to contend with. So, how much physical space does a microbe actually need? And so I, I kind of wanted to make an analogy for all of us, because I know this is something we don't think about. So this is the microbial ecosystem as we think of it. And what you can see here is we can talk about our eukaryote microbial organisms. And then when we talk about a bacterium on the surface, and this is a model as E. coli, we generally think a size of E. coli is about one micrometer. And so we'll talk a little bit about viruses at the end. And so this is, gives you the proportionality that Jens was alluding to in terms of bio size. So we came up with this model that life couldn't exist in shales. And it was based on this fact that all cells in the subsurface are probably one micrometer. And so we actually asked that question. And we went out to the shallow subsurface, so the soft rock that I alluded to in the intro, and we sampled. And we sampled microbial life. And we actually took cryo microscopy out to the field. And we looked at microbes out there. And what we found was that actually a majority of life in this subsurface was ultra small. Um, and so this is actually a microbe from the system. Um, and so they were at the limit for life, or the lowest, the smallest limit for life that we'd seen, about 250 nanometers. Um, it had a small amount of proteins. 
um, just to kind of extend bio, basically biomass and propagate life. I put this up here actually because it so, so often doesn't happen for us as scientists, but this is actually a 1999 National Academy report uh, that Ed was alluding to earlier where they were tasked with this idea of what are the limits for life. And they basically theoretically came up with this 250 nanometer diameter as the limits for life. And that's about what we're finding in these subsurface ecosystems. All right, so it was based, our idea that life couldn't exist in shales was based on this notion, one, that they'd been sterilized, and two, that it was too big to live in these pores. Well, it also turns out that these systems, this is my collaborator, Dave Cole, who's a geologist, they've also developed new tools in geological sciences, and they have much better, um, but much better imaging in these systems. And so here are some shale rocks from 3,200 meters. And what we thought was that we had these pore necks or openings to pore spaces that were really small. It turns out that there's a lot more heterogeneity in these systems. And we have a lot more of these fissures in these places, as Jason alluded to, where life could exist in hard rock. In addition, he's also found evidence of microbial end products. So this suggests to us that maybe these shales aren't these native sterile basins like we used to think they are, but that there's the potential for habitats for life. Um, and then the last thing I think both, both my uh, introductions have alluded to, we also had this assumption, I think, in geology that it could, life couldn't tolerate these extremes. And we know that's now completely false. Microbes can tolerate and even, in fact, grow at temperatures well above 100 degrees. And I really especially like this one here because it's relevant to fracking. Here we're talking about an organism at the surface that then we put under different pressures. And so what we can see is that even under different pressures, here we are right around the temperature that, or pressure that we see in the fract system, we can see that basically cells continue um, to metabolize. So metabolism is on the y-axis and pressures are down here. And so we can take organisms adapted to surface life and even put them under these conditions and they can still metabolize. All right, so unfortunately, as far as the punchline goes for life in pristine shales, uh, we're just starting and in fact, this is a drill rig that's actually funded by the Department of Energy. And this is the first time we've ever actually got industry, um, the natural gas industry, uh, the Department of Energy, and academia all sitting at a table. And so this is the first field site for shale energy. And what we, what's happening now is for the first time we actually have transparency. And so we're actually able to get pristine cores from these systems that we can do microbial analyses on. And actually here's my lab members can't see it too well, but they're sampling the cores. And so this is the first time we've seen this rock. This rock has seen the surface in 450 million years. And then we take them back to our molecular lab, right, which is in, housed in the hospital at OSU. And we sound like a construction zone, because here we do banging, drilling, everything to get DNA out of these systems. The bottom line is uh, we don't know what the biomass is in the system. And so hopefully in a couple, couple months, I'll have some answers for you. But we do know that when we frack these systems, the ecosystems change tremendously. And so to bring us up to speed on what I mean by fracking, it's the colloquial for hydraulic fracturing, essentially we're gonna drill down into these shales, these hydrocarbon gas rich regions, and then we're gonna drill laterally. What happens is we actually use high pressure water to fracture open and create fissures in the rocks. And so this porosity issue that I talked about was, harness, or was hindering potentially microbial life is actually also hindering gas exchange. So the idea is we fracture these systems and now gas can flow under pressure freely to the surface where we can recover methane gas. And so people historically haven't cared in, in these industries too much about microbial metabolism. And this is, again, a really young ecosystem. But we've, I think, in the last two years, made a really compelling case for why people should care. Um, and when we talk about one of the major concerns with hydraulic fracturing is this zone here, right? This is our fresh water. And we talk about limiting resources on this planet this access and keeping this freshwater zone pristine is really key. Um, and so we, managing these ecosystems and managing microbial metabolism in these ecosystems and this infrastructure turns out to be really important because microbes can actually corrode steel infrastructures by their metabolism and that can, in fact, cause leakages in the system. In addition, we're really interested into the idea of, okay, we have natural geologic methane in here, but are there microbes like Jason alluded to that can also produce methane in these systems? And can we use that to generate more methane? And so again, microbial metabolism really is important. So there's life before fracking and there's life after fracking. And life after fracking is a completely different story. It's like we took this system and put it on steroids. 
Essentially, we're going into the subsurface now, we're bl blowing it up, and now we're injecting from the surface surface organisms, potentially. We didn't know when we started, so it's a spoiler alert. Um, and we're also injecting lots and lots of water. This water contains many times chemicals, um, many times biocides to actually inhibit microbial growth, but we'll see some slides later to say that maybe these are nutrient sources. And then they also s include some silica sand. And here's an example of the silica sand. It's called what we call propent. And the idea here is that it just keeps open these fissures. OK, so we're going to track fracking microbes. Um, and so here's actually our, stuff, our site in Marcellus. And so here's a, one of our sites, at least. Here's a freshwater lake. They pump freshwater up into these blender systems in here. These blenders then, essentially chemicals and sand, are mixed into these systems and injected downhole. So the fracking actually happens once. So we hydraulically fracture the system, just as I described earlier, and then we monitor the system, the input going into the system, and what's coming out on the surface in the water over time. And so we monitor, though, this is just a wellhead. You know, you expect, at least when I started, I expected these really elaborate wellheads. It's actually not that impressive when you see a fracking wellhead. And so this is actually what we're, where we're collecting the water on the surface. And so we're going to collect it in early time points and then over a year period. And the first thing we did when we got these samples back in the lab was ask, do we even see microbes there? Is there any evidence that microbes are coming out the other side? And this is just an SEM from that. And you can see here, there, there are cells present and coming out. So what has changed in our ability to sample the deep biosphere? Um, at the same time that we started this project, our tools as microbiologists had changed. And so previously, we would count cells or we could maybe infer microbes were there by a DNA signature. But at the same time, our sequencing technology ramped up and our ability to use sequencing technology. And so now what we can do is we don't need to cultivate these organisms like Zobel did on an auger plate. We can actually just take the DNA right from the environment and actually get a metabolic blueprint, if everything works well, of the microbes' metabolism. And so this is exactly what we did. We just filtered the samples. This is what the filters actually look like, so lots of iron minerals and things that we have to contend with. We throw it on a sequencer, and then we spend many, many months <laughs> on this part uh, to yield us metabolic maps. And so let's talk about the system over time. On the x-axis, we have time. So here's our input sample, our early and late. And I'm just showing you a handful to keep it simple. On the y-axis, we have salinity. And so what you can see is we inject this fresh water into the system. But over time, the system, the output, the water coming out of the system, takes on a signature of the shale. So remember, these shales, when they were deposited, were former marine seabeds. And so as this water equilibrates with the system, the salinity in these systems leaches out. And so that's exactly what we see. And this is just a conductivity. It's a measure of basically electrical charge. And we use it to approximate salinity. So our input organisms, they're lakes. They're very diverse. We put, you know, so we have a lot of different organisms. It doesn't really matter for this talk that we know who these organisms are. We're just looking at the changes over time. Then we have the early system, and this is within the first 14 days. And this is still as a system as, yes. So that True. Yes. And we can monitor. It depends on the system. Sometimes we get water outflow for five days, and many times it goes for about five years. And the water that we actually recover is only about 30% of what goes in. And one of the big questions in geosciences is, is where's the water? Um, so yeah, I think this is still a very young, young industry. Um, <laughs> startling. Um, and then as we shift, and this is this red line I wanted to note you to, because it's something we'll keep referring to. This is as we actually get into this equilibrated state. And we see that after about 15 days, I'm just showing you two points here the system shifts to these organisms that are all halo-tolerant. This organism right here, Hala anaerobium, halo is it the first part of its name, meaning salt, um, turns out to be the dominant shale organism. So regardless of where we sample this system, we always find this organism. And we'll talk a little bit more about this organism later. So our first question we got these samples back is, that's well and good. Are these native bugs? Are these organisms that we're seeing for this first time? And so all we did is look, took the sequences of the organisms we were getting in the outputs, these late time points, and mined them from the inputs. And you can maybe hint at it here, but it turns out that they're present there in the input material. And so these are really low abundant members, less than 6% in the input material. But they bloom down in the deep subsurface. 
And we can correlate that to cell biomass. And so we actually know that this is proportional to cell mass increasing in these systems. And so here we are, and this, I mean, this for me as a microbiologist kind of blew my mind, is that we could take organisms from the surface and inject them into this foreign habitat that had high salinities and high pressures and things that they weren't necessarily adapted to at the surface, and they could grow and thrive. And so this is just a map of all the studies. It's a handful of studies that have been done. The data I'm going to show you today from my lab is the first genomic study. Um, these are all from fractured water systems, and so they're just, you know, th dotted throughout the country. And I don't want to get into the details too much, but I wanted to point out this HAL anaerobium. So this HAL anaerobium wasn't sampled in one study, but in every other study that we've seen it, it's been detected. And so it really is this key organism when we talk about life in shales. But the pattern is similar. Many of the organisms that we see in our systems are shared across these shale systems. Keep in mind, these shale systems are using different input materials. They're run by different operators. They're done by totally different labs. These are many different methods up here I'm not showing you. So the fact that we see this convergence in microbial organisms says or suggests that there's some high selectivity happening in this ecosystem that we don't quite have a handle on yet. Okay, so salinity. This is a big constraint to life. We're taking surface organisms and freshwater and putting them under a high saline condition. And so we mined our genomic data. We had a whole database of all the metabolisms in these genomes that these organisms could do. And we asked the question is, how in the world are these organisms adapting? And it turns out that the production of osmoprotectants is absolutely critical to the, your success in this ecosystem. And so essentially what happens in a high salt environment is the organisms themselves produce proteins or produce compounds to combat the salinity exchange. And so the glycine betaine of all the organisms we sampled, every single genome had the capacity to produce glycine betaine. And so this looks like a very important feature for adaptation in, in the shale ecosystem. And so I just, we don't need to talk about this in detail, but I wanted to give you a sense that what we're talking about here is metabolic pathways and genomes, and then we can correlate those to organisms, and then we can look at basically our ability to produce these from a microbial perspective, from native compounds in the fluids, as well as actually compounds that we're putting into these fracture fluids that are going down the hole. And so in a sense, we're actually putting in compounds like choline, which is actually added to stabilize clays, that are facilitating the adaptability of these organisms in this ecosystem. And so this is also to show you, this is just a fluid sample. I just showed you one well to keep it simple. But here's our line for salinity. And we don't see any glycine betaine produced in the inputs. And then as we move through time, and we basically, this is time, unfortunately, no, <laughs> the x-axis didn't come through, but you'll just have to take my words. This is up to about a year after fracking. And you can see that glycine betaine is released into the environment. So we saw this information, and that, that was kind of perplexing to us, because I just told you that glycine betaine is an osmoprotectant. So the organisms are actually synthesizing it intracellularly. And so we were stuck with this conundrum of how in the world are we detecting this extracellularly? And there is some evidence of leakage, but it wouldn't account for the amounts that we were, we were seeing in the system. And so we asked the question then is, is there a viral lysis in the system? Are there viruses in the system that could be preying on these microbial populations and lysing them, and then thus releasing this glycine betaine into the environment? And so Jens uh, talked about a study that actually he participated in, and this is really what we knew about at the time that we started this. Uh, we know that viruses are present in the subsurface, we know that they were detected at depth, and we actually know that their biomass probably exceeds that of the microbes. When we looked at the fractured shale, consistent with what Jens's data suggested is that there was about three to four times more viral biomass than microbial biomass, we recovered four to eight times more viral genomes than microbial genomes in these systems. And so now keep in mind what we have is we have a database of all the bacteria and their genomic contents. We have a database of the viruses and their genomic contents. And so we asked, is there a way that we can link this genomic information to see if there's been interactions between these two groups. And so it actually turns out that some bacteria have an immune system just like you and me. And this immune system is called a CRISPR-Cas system. But all you need to know is that what happens when a, vi when a bacterial cell is invaded by a virus, it actually recognizes that as foreign and takes a snapshot of that viral DNA. It then encodes that viral DNA in its own genome. And so now it has a recognition system for foreign DNA. And so our hypothesis was is that we could take 
that signature in the bacterial genomes and say, okay, let's, let's mine all the viruses these organisms interacted with, and now let's query it to our viral genome database, and let's see if we get any hits. And when we did that, we were blown away. And so when, when people have done this approach before, they may have over like 14, um, maybe, maybe over about three years have seen 14 kinds of hits. What we found first is what we're looking at here is the hosts. So here are all the ovals are all our bacterial host. The diamonds are our viruses. And the first thing you'll notice, this is how anaerobium, our key organism in the system, is that they're interacting with a wide range of viral genomes. Um, and this means that these organisms have at least encountered this DNA. Um, and that these change over time, so time is shaded here. And so we were really surprised to see that every organism at later time points had a CRISPR system. That's completely unusual. So in marine systems, very few organisms have CRISPR systems. In the human gut, very few organisms. So this defense strategy, we began to wonder, is this a, a result of the habitat that they're living in? Because maybe in this physical environment, when you're in smaller pore sizes, it's really integral that you have some sort of viral immunity. But anyhow, it was very important for us to kind of create some hypotheses, which is what metagenomics gives us, or the ability to sample genomes from multiple communities, um, about what may be happening and the kinds of interactions that are happening in these systems. What we can say is that this genome has seen this virus before. We don't know what that role is, but it shows that there is some sort of interaction between these two. And so to put this together for you, um, up here I talk about salinity. It's small, I apologize, but you can hear it. So here's the salinity profile. And as a reaction to the salinity, organisms produce osmoprotectants. It turns out that if there is ongoing viral attack in these systems, that could release these osmoprotectants. Then we tracked the ability of these osmoprotectants to actually serve as a fuel source. We know they're available in the fluids. And so we can actually find evidence for the fact that these can be broken down by different microbes, which ultimately produce products that can fuel the methanogens in the system. And so we have this kind of unique interplay between our engineering of the system and our input materials and the organisms we're putting down whole and then the organism's ability to respond to that, that then kind of fuels this potentially sustaining microbial ecosystem. And so just to give you a hand, uh, kind of a concept of where we are today, we've isolated now in my lab these key organisms, and we're actually kind of recapitulating these genomics hypotheses today. But uh, to date, we've isolated these organisms using the metabolisms that we learned about in their genomic information. And we are really excited about this idea of methane production in the system um, because if we're going to talk about the sustainability of hydrocarbon recovery over the long term, this may be an avenue. Another take-home point here is that these biocides that we're putting into the system, I didn't talk about it as much, are actually potentially fueling microbial life. Ironic. Um, so deep thoughts from all of our talks today. There's a huge amount of biomass in the deep biosphere. It's not this sterile environment that we all thought it once was. Um, Pristine environments are much more stable than the, the kind of exception I was just talking about with hydraulic fracturing. And they may not have this low energy flux and this huge amount of biomass that I alluded to with hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing creates the physical space, the organism input, and also provides the chemicals that could sustain microbial life. And we don't know what kind of ramifications this has um, to the deep biosphere or to energy metabolism or energy recovery at the surface. And so for me, this has been really kind of reinvigorating because it's really kind of taught me about the, the resiliency of life and the fact that we can actually put microbes from the surface into fo totally foreign environments and watch them um, grow. And then I wanted to touch on the fact that we have new genomic tools. We have microscopic tools. Claire, are you going to be showing some of your cryo stuff? So Claire, no? Oh, darn. OK. Uh, we have some great new microscopy tools. And then Jens alluded to the physiological tools. So we have all sorts of new arsenal um, where we can now recover more information about just cells down in the system, but what these organisms are doing, how they're interacting with viruses, and how they're interacting with the geochemistry of the system. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank the organizers and everyone for listening. Thank you.